crisp. So today's episode is a interesting murder mystery tale from the 1940s involving a very wealthy man, Sir Harry Oakes, and uh, surprisingly the Duke of Windsor, who was uh, supposed to become king and because he married Wallace Simpson, uh, you know, had to abdicate the throne and eventually he was given a post in the Bahamas, which is where this uh, incident occurs. And um, it's, it's an interesting situation because although the prince was not directly involved with the murder because he had a uh, governorship or some sort of authority, uh, obviously, as his post from the British Isles, he uh, was able to influence the investigation, and that's how he is involved with this particular, uh, I guess you could call it a conspiracy as to, um, you know, who was, uh, ended up becoming the murder suspect and so forth. They, everything was sort of pushed in a certain direction. The actual culprit, uh, as far as people are concerned, uh, got away with murder. And we'll get into that in terms of uh, those particular conspiracies. But uh, let's begin here. And uh, it starts in um, 1940. Winston Churchill arranged for the Duke of Windsor to be shipped off as governor of the Bahamas, where with his well-known Nazi sympathies, he would do the least damage to the British war effort. He would not have expected the former king to be involved in a scandal much more shocking than his affair with Wallace Simpson, for on a dark and stormy night in early July 1943, the Bahamas' richest and most powerful citizen, Sir Harry Oakes, was brutally murdered, and the Duke of Windsor would be implicated in an attempt to pervert the course of justice and frame an innocent man for the crime. Sir Harry Oakes, an American-born Canadian who owned the second-largest gold mine in the Americas, had moved to the Bahamas for tax purposes and taken out British citizenship with his Australian-born wife Eunice, and they also had five children, determined to keep his vast fortune intact and untaxed. He had nonetheless brought an economic boom to the colony through his investments in property development and had been created a baronet for his generous philanthropy. He was a member of the House of Assembly and a much-loved benefactor. With his whole family abroad on vacation at the time, it was Oakes, house guest Harold Christie, who found his body on the morning of July 8th. Oakes lay on his bed, his head staved in, his body strewn with feathers from a pillow that doused in, that was doused in petrol, and the bed set alight. Only the rain coming in through the window had prevented the body from being entirely engulfed in flames. A Chinese lacquered screen nearby was partially burned and covered in blood and smudges of handprints. There was a bloody handprint on the wall above the bed, muddy footprints on the stairs, and traces of petrol everywhere in the house. The post-mortem revealed blisters on the body that were not caused by the fire. As Governor Windsor took the unusual step of immediately taking control of the investigation while suppressing news of the murder for several days, while the local police were perfectly competent to handle the case, he decided to call in outside help. Due to the war, bringing in experts from Scotland Yard was out of the question, but instead of calling in British security personnel stationed in New York and Washington, Windsor engaged two detectives from the Miami police, Captains Melkin and Barker, whom he knew from his frequent trips to Florida. Despite Windsor's attempt at press censorship, the case would become an international sensation and sweep the war news off the front pages. Much to the local police's chagrin, the American detectives took control of the investigation, and within 36 hours they had arrested and charged Oakes, son-in-law, Count Alfred de Marigny, for the murder. De Marigny, a French uh, Mauritian businessman, was well known to be in conflict with his father-in-law 
who had disapproved of the twice-married playboys eloping with his 18-year-old daughter, Nancy. According to the detectives, Demon Marigny's fingerprints had been found on the Chinese lacquered screen. Informed of her father's death and her husband's arrest, Nancy immediately returned and took over her husband's defense. She brought in her own private investigator, Raymond Schneider, and fingerprint expert, Professor Keeler. Schneider was horrified to find on visiting the crime scene that police officers were cleaning up the room, thus erasing all the evidence. He was never to know who had ordered the cleaning, but concluded that it must have been someone highly influential. He also discovered that the police were bugging his phone. Meanwhile, Demerigny's first choice of barrister, the colony's finest, had been snapped up by the Crown prosecution. While the police never passed on Demerigny's request for his services, despite their claims to be fingerprint experts, whether through design or incompetence, the two American detectives led one of the worst botched investigations in the colony's history. Not only did they forget to bring their latent fingerprint camera, a vital piece of equipment they allowed visitors onto the crime scene and did nothing to stop them handling objects in the room. Then, as we have seen, they allowed the room to be scrubbed clean. Though their case relied on fingerprint evidence, they left a large number of fingerprints unprocessed and failed to take the visitor's fingerprints for the purposes of elimination. The photographs they did take of the many handprints were ruined when the plates were exposed to light. As for the damning fingerprints, it was gratuitously discovered by Detective Barker after Demerigny had been held in police custody for several hours, and after the Duke of Windsor came to the police station and had a private conversation with the detectives. Furthermore, the material allegedly used to lift the fingerprints was not the usual sticky tape which left the print intact, but rubber which destroyed it. In court, Barker could not pinpoint exactly where on the screen he had found the fingerprint, while Detective Melkin denied knowing about it until several days later. Exactly when he found out varied under cross-examination, Professor Keeler testified for the defense that the fingerprint could not have come from the Chinese screen, but had been lifted from a flat surface, perhaps a glass used by Demerigny in in the police station. The detectives discredited evidence together with Demerigny's film firm alibi that he had been entertaining guests that evening, one of whom stayed over and saw him in the early hours when the murder was believed to have taken place, made an acquittal inevitable. As for the Duke of Windsor, he and the Duchess contrived to be abroad throughout the trial so that he was never called on to testify. Despite numerous requests, Windsor never allowed the case to be reopened. However, he did ensure that de Marigny was deported from the colony. So who killed Sir Harry Oakes and why? And what was the Duke of Windsor's interest in the case? With all the evidence destroyed and all the participants long dead, we'll never know the answer, but the close-knit community of Bahamian High Society had thrown up a list of suspects and possible motives worthy of an Agatha Christie novel. In fact, it has generated a swath of books, films, and even a West End play, all burning forward in unproven and unprovable theories of varying plausibility. First of all, we might ask why the Duke of Windsor took such a personal interest in the case. It may well have been simply because he wanted to avoid a sordid scandal, and so tried to get the case closed as soon as possible. Allegedly loathing de Marigny, he was simply unconcerned that an innocent man might hang. Another theory is that Windsor feared a thorough investigation might uncover that he was involved with Oaks in money laundering to finance his lavish lifestyle that went well beyond and his inadequate allowance from the British government. Other theories revolve around Windsor's relationship 
with Swedish millionaire industrialist Axel Wienergren, who came to the Bahamas in the world's largest private yacht. He was rumored to have close ties with the Nazis and to have brokered the friendly relations between Germany and Sweden. He had established a bank in Mexico through which it was feared he planned to take control of the Mexican economy. It was through this bank that Windsor was believed to be doing his money laundering. According to one theory, Oakes was killed because he had discovered that Windsor and Wiener Gren were Nazi spies. Another theory is that Oakes, too, was considering moving his money to Mexico and was killed to prevent him from ruining the Bahamian economy by doing so. Another dubious character lurking about was an American with connections to the Mafia, Frank Marshall. He is believed to have been the front man for the mobsters Lucky Luciano and Mayor Lansky, who were planning to build casinos and hotels in the Bahamas. Both Oaks and Windsor were against changing the law to allow the casinos to be built. Allegedly, Marshall had recruited Harold Christie, he was the man who had discovered Oak's body, to persuade them to change their minds. Harold Christie was a native of the Bahamas who had made his way up the social ladder as a real estate broker. He and Oaks had become business associates with friends after Christie sold Oaks half the properties in the Bahamas, getting very well rewarded in the process. Although Christie was never considered a suspect, testimony given at the trial certainly puts him in a dubious light. Christie testified that he and several others had been invited to a soiree at Oaks' home on the evening of the murder. All the other guests had left by 11, but Christie stayed on, and having had a bit too much to drink, spent the night in the guest room just up the hall from Oak's bedroom. Although he admitted to waking up a couple of times in the night, he claimed that he had not heard anything suspicious over the sound of the storm. The defense questioned Christie intensely about the fact that he had parked his car well out of sight and a distance from the house, instead of right in front of the house as he usually did. Meanwhile, a local police officer testified that he had seen Christie in town riding in a station wagon coming away from the port. Although he had mysteriously drowned before, he could testify a night watchman had claimed to have seen an unfamiliar boat in the harbor and two men come off the boat, get in a car, and drive away. These inconsistencies have given rise to several theories. One theory purports that Frank Marshall was under pressure from the mob to force Oaks to change his mind. With Christie's help, he had got Oaks onto the mysterious boat where he was tortured. Inopportunely, Oaks died, and Christie helped to get him back to the house where the murder was staged. The fact that the two detectives came from Miami and might well have been on Lansky's payroll lends some weight to this theory. However, another similar theory is that Christie had borrowed a great deal of money from Oaks, who, since he was planning to go to Mexico, had called in his loan, unable to pay it back. Christie had called in his disreputable brother to help him kill Oaks. The house was supposed to have burnt down, destroying all traces of the crime, but the rain had thwarted that plan, and Christie had had to discover the body instead. Whatever his involvement in the murder, Harold Christie did not suffer from the association. He became a leading party developer in the Bahamas, made millions, and was knighted in 1964. Despite her heroic defense of her husband, Nancy and de Marigny were divorced in 1949. Axel Wiener-Gren was blacklisted by the Allies during the war, and his assets froze and stranded him in Mexico while he was vacationing there. However, he has since been cleared of all suspicion of pro-Nazi activity, and after the war, continued his career as a pioneering industrialist. The Duke and Duchess of Windsor returned to France, where they saw out their lives in quiet retirement. There is no trace of what became of Frank Marshall. So uh, that's the basic story of what happened. Um, now I went and looked at a couple of other articles.
else on this particular case, and it they're all of them, as well as the books that have been written about this, point the finger at the guy named Harold Christie, because Harold Christie had a, uh, there were two other murders in association with this Oaks case, and those people were killed in a similar fashion, and they were involved with Harold Christie. Uh, so, who was this guy? And, um, you know, what was his connection with the Oaks, and why would he want to uh, be involved with a situation like this if he's just, you know, a real estate agent? Um, you know, how did this become such a sinister situation between him and Oaks? Well, according to some people, uh, Christy had a, uh, a lot of loans that um, he owed Oaks. Uh, there was a property that, uh, called the case that Harold Christie was had invested in, but he had used Oaks money. Oaks was supposedly going to call in the loan, and so people believed that, oh, that's the reason that, you know, he wanted to do him in. But the thing is, Christie was staying at Oaks' house for the whole weekend. He wasn't just staying that night. He was there the Saturday and the Sunday. So he was spending the weekend over there. Um, and, you know, he's clearly his friend. This was not a situation where there was a lot of uh, some sort of, you know, big confrontation. Yes, maybe the money was going to be called in at some point, but I don't think that he was calling in the loan right away. These guys were not at odds with each other. He's not going to allow this uh, person to stay over at his house for the weekend if there was some sort of a fight between them. So I think they were okay money-wise. He did owe him money, though. But uh, I think that they were handling that part of the situation. I think the interesting point about this uh, case comes about with uh, the situation with the casinos. Oaks did not want casinos in the Bahamas uh, for whatever reason. He felt that it would bring in a level of debauchery onto the islands that didn't, you know, currently exist. It was actually a kind of wild place because there were a lot of um, people from around the world, a lot of Nazis too, that had surfaced over there because it was a territory that uh, they had a little more freedom in it. They were kind of removed from their countries when things were getting quite a bit, you know, when things were getting hot for them uh, because of their Nazi sympathies. They had a lot of money and there was a lot of crazy stuff going on, but for some reason, Oaks did not want a uh, casino, the, you know, the casino system built there, and he had uh, somehow convinced the governor, the prince, um, the Duke of Windsor, uh, you know, also that he didn't want casinos over there, and so both of them apparently agreed about this. I don't know that the Duke of Windsor was actually that concerned about it, but he did not want Oaks to leave the island because that's what Oaks was threatening, that he would leave if the casinos came. And if Oaks left, all of the money that he brought with him that he was keeping in the Bahamas would leave, and that would totally tank the economy. So I think the prince was actually just agreeing with him just to keep him there, keep him stationary so that his money was in the bomb and banks. Um, the money situation, I mean, he had made so much money in Canada, so he was an American. Oaks was an American who had... Uh, apparently had had some dreams about finding gold and was obsessed with it and then he uh, went to Canada and just prospected in the right areas and found one of the largest gold mines in uh, North America so he had made a tremendous amount of money but he, because of the taxation system he removed all of that money and that's the reason that he was sort of sequestered in the Bahamas really just to keep his money intact and um, he was in a very important position though because because of his extraordinary wealth the entire island prospered you know, all of the economy was affected by his, uh, the monetary success that he had and was had brought into the island. So he 
it was very important. He needed to be kept in the Bahamas as far as all of the government officials were concerned. Um, so now we have a situation where there are gangsters, big time gangsters in the United States who want to open casinos in the Bahamas because this is a booming place, very similar to Havana. And if you remember, um, you know, scenes from The Godfather where there was like a lot of uh, sort of uh, freedom and, and wildness that was going on in Cuba in, in that movie that was kind of happening in the Bahamas in the 40s as well. And so they wanted to bring casinos in there. And uh, you had this major character not wanting it, threatening to leave if they were brought in, and the prince kind of just agreeing just to keep him there. But the gangsters, Lucky Luciano and um, others, you know, they didn't care about whether the bomb and uh, economy tanked. They felt that if they brought their casinos in, uh, they would be able to, you know, corner that market as well as uh, you know, that the economy would probably prosper under, you know, with all of that increased revenue that would be coming in. So they were not concerned about keeping uh, Harry Oaks in the Bahamas at all. So they were not concerned about what was going on with uh, the Prince and Oaks, you know, situation. Now, what was the Prince's involvement with uh, money laundering? The Prince apparently was taking loans from Oaks. He was also taking loans from this Werner Grand character, this other Nazi, who was very wealthy, and he apparently um, was taking loans from these gangsters because I don't know what, uh, how much money he was getting from the British government, but apparently he was used to a very different kind of lifestyle that was, uh, to, you know, was extremely expensive, I guess, and so he was taking loans from all kinds of people, including these gangsters, as well as these, and part of his, uh, the method that he was getting it from the gangsters had to do with these, um, police officers that were on their payrolls, so, you know, the the police officers that he brought in from Miami. So he was actually kind of indebted to these guys. He, I don't know that those were necessarily loans, considered loans, but they were considered favors from those particular gangsters. They were basically bribing him um, to change the law. And so he wanted to do this in a very covert way. So I guess their plan was if they can um, get rid, I guess their plan was if they could get rid of Sir Harry Oaks, blame it on the son-in-law who he already had a fight with, then a situation might get resolved because if um, the son-in-law was put in prison in the Bahamas, then the daughter Nancy, who was set to inherit the money from her father, she would have then stayed on the island and then the money wouldn't have left. Oaks would be out of the picture and pretty much all of their problems would be solved. Um, so I think that this was somewhat of the plan. Now this is where that other guy, Harold Christie, gets involved because Harold Christie was the person that Lucky Luciano and, and the various other mobsters uh, recruited to it first. They were, I guess they were trying to convince uh, Mary Oaks, but that was not going anywhere. Uh, I think the plan was that Harold Christie was going to be the guy who would basically let in the culprit who was going to do the crime in the first place. So he was the guy on the inside uh, that they owned, and they did own him because he had um, loan situations from those gangsters as well. So at some point, uh, Harold Christie, I think, was probably threatened whether he would have gone out of his way to um, hurt his friend in this capacity because they had been friends for a number of years. Uh, I don't think he would have to betray him in this capacity. I think he was threatened directly, and that was the way that uh, this whole thing transpired. So Harold Christie was there over, uh, for the you know two nights. Harold Christie is the one who also um, dismissed the maid and the cook, and I, I think there was a gardener or something, so he dismissed all of the help that night, which is a strange thing because this is Harry Oak's house. 
wise Harold Christie sitting there dismissing the servants. I think Harold Oaks, uh, Harry Oaks had been uh, sedated. I think that at around 11 o'clock, which is when he went up to retire, Christie went up to the room with him um, to play checkers according to him. So they're sitting there playing checkers and I think his drink was spiked with some sort of sedative and Oaks was out basically at that point because, you know, a guest is not going to go down and start dismissing the staff on his own. Harry Oaks uh, was in normal, you know, senses and everything. Up until 11, he had been playing games in the downstairs parlor. He wasn't particularly tired. He wouldn't have been. If he wanted to dismiss the staff, he would have done it right there before he went upstairs. So um, th I think that he was sedated when he w went upstairs to the room. Then... Harold Christie with all, you know, the house empty. Harold Christie leaves. He had already parked his car uh, away from the house. He was not parked in the front. So even if somebody had been there, they would never have seen him coming and going, which was the point. He needed, a, you know, to have an easy coming and going situation. So he left, went to the pier, picked somebody up in a boat, and the person the fisherman, whoever it was, who got them off the, um, the, the pier saw that the two men, so he had said that these two, he had gotten some guy, apparently had come in, at least from the Miami, uh, boat station, whatever, he had, he had brought somebody in, so, and then that guy, that, that particular witness was killed, and he was burnt, so this is another weird thing. That's the first person that was associated with this case that, uh, you know, died mysteriously because he was never able to come out as a witness against Daryl Christie and say, yeah, he came to the, to the, uh, to the pier to pick up this guy. Okay, so now he's picked up this guy and now he's driving from, you know, the central area and he is spotted by none other than one of the, uh, the by a police sergeant who recognizes Harold Christie. He said he was sitting in the car and there was another man in the car. Um, he would have recognized if it was Sir Harry Oaks and he didn't. So it was Christie and whoever had been brought in, possibly this Frank Marshall character. So Christie brings this guy, you know, a hitman, a professional hitman to the house. He has full access to the house at this point because none of the servants are there. The room is only 18 feet away from the other guy and it's connected through the veranda. So that was the entry point is just, you know, um, come in through the veranda's, uh, you know, window or, or patio door, whatever. And, um, the thing is, I think there would have been a much bigger struggle if Harry Oaks was not sedated. I think he was totally sedated in that situation. And because of this, they were able to go about their various activities. So he was bludgeoned, but then he was also sprayed with insecticide and lit a fire. Um, in one of the articles, they're saying that the focus of the fire was on the genitalia. And the reason was because Harold Christie had some sort of um, homosexual relationship with Harry Oaks. Uh, and that was the reason. I, I don't really buy that only because most of the time, if you're going to douse something, you know, you almost always will focus in right in the center of that object. So obviously genitalia is right there. That's probably, you know, where he was focusing all of the liquid because it was probably focusing it on the center of the bed. And that's what burnt, uh, you know, the most because there was the most product on that bed. Now, why did he use insecticide? That was just something that he had available to him. Um, the woman, the, one of the maids had left that in the house because there was a mosquito situation. Um, and so apparently people used to spray around the room at night so that they weren't attacked by mosquitoes and so forth. But it was not an extremely flammable substance. It, you know, would uh, flame out. And I guess these guys didn't know that. Um, there was another reason that they wanted to set the body aflame. They wanted to, one, remove evidence. But then there was this bizarre thing of all of these feathers, you know, that the body was burnt and then feathered. Uh, that had to do with Harold Christie wanting to put the blame on local people, saying that this was some act 
exactly the direction that Harold Christie wanted this, you know, the direction that he wanted the investigation to go to believe that some voodoo priest had broken in Terry Oak's house and, uh, you know, burned him and then put feathers all over him. The feathers are kind of ridiculous, but it's clearly an idea of someone who has only heard, you know, of stories of how uh, various incidents have occurred and this was what he was trying to do. This was not somebody who knew what he was doing. Um, I think that the main murderer was Marshall and I don't think there was any uh, fight because I think that Oaks was already sedated when all of this went down. So there were palm prints all over the place. For some unknown reason, Harold Christie was not checked for fingerprints. Well, not an un unknown reason. The two cops that were brought in from Miami didn't check anybody's fingerprints. So there were palm prints and blood prints all over the place. Um, none of that was checked in any appropriate manner. Um, they right away called in uh, the son-in-law, and they kept him there for quite a few hours. They apparently got a fingerprint from a glass that they, he was drinking from, and then that one fingerprint, one fingerprint, was the, what was, they revolved the entire case around. Um, so it was just, like, totally ridiculous. They had people coming in and out of the place. They also didn't have photographs. They said all the photographs, uh, the plates were all messed up from the light. They didn't have the photographic fingerprint camera. I mean, there was just all kinds of, the, the case was completely botched, and part of the reason was that the Prince of Windsor did not want um, this case to be investigated properly. It would have shown that Harold Christie was more than likely involved. It would have shown that there was a second person involved, and it was probably Frank Marshall. They might not have been able to ever get to Frank Marshall, but Christie might have talked in the end if he had ever been arrested. And uh, the prince didn't want his, you know, financial situation exposed, which would have inevitably happened once all of these people got exposed. Uh, they would have started talking. So he wanted this case shut down as quickly as possible and to blame it on this, uh, you know, Marigny guy was the best possible way to sort of completely swerve attention away from Harold Christie. And, you know, he didn't care about Marigny. Marigny was of no consequence to him, apparently. And that's what happened. But because Marigny was at a party the night before and was up with his guests up into the late night hours, there is no way that uh, he committed this crime because this was done some at some point after 11 p.m. at some point in the middle of the night and then you even have a police sergeant uh I witnessing the guy Harold Christie driving with somebody you have the wharf guy uh from the pier saying that yeah Christie picked somebody up from the pier and then later on at another point Harold Christie's secretary who had uh, found out some information about Oaks through um, some, I don't know what she was going through, paperwork that she was going through. She ended up dead and was killed in a very similar manner. She was burnt. Um, and then there was a lawyer who had come in, who had flown in at some point, maybe two or three years after, who was also involved, uh, involved in investigating the Oaks case. And then that woman was killed and burnt. So, uh, I mean, you've now got three people, uh, four including Harry Oaks, that are directly... Uh, seem to be killed but in the same manner. This is very bizarre. They're all related to the case, and this, and they're also involved with this uh, Harold Christie guy because the lawyer was staying with Harold Christie, and obviously the secretary was his secretary, and the wharf guy had seen him. So I mean, you know, this is clearly Harold Christie had done it. Anyway, the guy who had written the novel, I can't remember the name of it. It's something like um, the uh, something, th th what the heart wants, or something like that. That guy was in the Bahamas. The author, 
um, and was basically asking questions at a party, you know, who do you guys think this was some big, you know, to do that was going on in the Bahamas, and he said, who do you guys think, um, killed Sir Harry Oaks, he's like, the most famous case over here, and everyone said, it's Harold Christie, everyone knows it's Harold Christie, and, uh, then a couple of the security from the party came in and said, you need to stop asking questions about Sir Harry Oaks, and otherwise we're going to throw you out of the party. He said, okay, fine, I won't ask any more questions. Um, so he didn't, but he, that was uh, Harold Christie's party. So um, he then wrote a book about this whole situation directly blaming Harold Christie as the culprit. I think it's Christie. I don't think there's any doubt. If there's such a major incident going on only 18 feet away from you and your rooms are correct, connected by a veranda, you would have heard a whole, you know, situation going on. Um, and, you know, what are you doing driving around at night, picking up people and their eyewitnesses who have seen you driving around at night? So I think, like they said, the plan was that they were supposed to burn, you know, the whole place down. Um, and then Harold Christie would not have directly discovered the body. He would have, you know, just tried to escape during the fire kind of a thing. And, oh, his poor friend had been killed in the fire and couldn't, uh, you know, help to rescue him. I think that was what the plan was. But because the rain did not allow the fire to take hold, plus the insecticide was a burnout style insect. Uh, it wasn't flammable the way that he thought it would be. Um, you know, the body was not fully burnt and nothing fully burnt. The bed didn't fully burn. And so he, the, the end plan was that, you know, in the morning at seven o'clock, he goes to, through the veranda. And as the testimony was kind of ridiculous, he said he came from his room to the veranda. He sees this guy burned on the bed and uh, tries to wake him. And then says that he goes downstairs to get him a glass of water. Like, what? I can't even believe he said this at the trial, but that's what he said at the trial. Uh, doesn't call the police, doesn't do anything appropriate, goes downstairs and, you know, says that he gets him, tries to get him a glass of water. Okay, so this is like such made-up stuff. It's so ridiculous. Uh, finally, when the police come, came, um, you know, those were the first set of police officers uh, were taken off the case. I don't actually think they even came initially to the to the station. Um, the governor was called, so the prince was called first, and then those two detectives came and, like he said, the murder was suppressed. The information about the murder was suppressed for several days, and that was to delay you know, for those uh, guys to come in from Miami to take over the case, at which point um, they were there, and then right after that, they uh, the whole place was scrubbed down. So it was just, you know, there's, it was not a case that they wanted solved or that anyone was trying to solve. They were, this was a cover-up big time. They wanted to keep Oaks's money in the Bahamas, and as far as I know, it was kept there, but unless uh, Nancy, who left maybe with the... Um, who left with her husband. Maybe she took all of the money. I don't really know what happened as far as the money is concerned. And, uh, you know, the gangsters that were involved. It's it's unknown what happened, but Harold Christie remained on the islands, became a multimillionaire, and was even knighted in the end, you know, for basically doing what everybody wanted. And nobody, uh, everybody knew he had done it, and nobody said anything like you know they weren't able to do anything about it um it, the one lucky thing is because uh Marigny was um had a guest you know filled party that night and had enough people vouching for his whereabouts it was the only way that he got away otherwise he would have 100 percent you know been taken in for this crime there's no doubt about it that was the plan and uh, he only got away because he had such a solid alibi contradicting what everybody else was saying and this one supposed fingerprint, which they don't even have now. So it's it's a bizarre case. It just shows how ruthless, you know, big money can get and how ruthless it gets when you've got these people who already have, uh, you know, low 
scruples and then you get them involved with um, gangsters and it's just like oh my gosh the, it was just a formula for a disaster and Sir Harry Oaks was the one blockage to those casinos coming in and he was the but he was also a needed member in the Bahamas and just because he had not gotten out of the situation in time uh, he was basically killed is, is the situation that happened uh, just because the prince didn't want him to leave but the casino guys wanted to bring those casinos in so this was their solution you get rid of him you keep the money on the islands and uh, you, you know you just put the son-in-law away he'll be stuck on the islands as will the daughter as will the money that was the original plan that didn't work out that way but um, the case was not properly solved either. The actual culprits never were, you know, arrested. And then subsequent people were killed afterwards that were involved with this case or found out any information about this case. Uh, they were killed in the, uh, pra practically the same way. So it's almost like you have a serial killer and a serial Christie character, um, you know, who's living his greatest life over there in the Bahamas. Uh, you know, an open murderer, and yet nobody does anything about it because he was had apparently become very powerful through the various businesses that he owned. At, you know, as a result of his loans not being called in by Oaks, and then uh, his involvement with the uh, uh, mobsters, casinos, the lo all of that stuff. He just, you know, he just did. Uh, very well and was never charged with anything uh who knows if he felt guilty about it in his later years but you know he clearly um was in a position that he could have committed the crime if not directly i don't think he maybe directly did it but he brought in the person who did do it so he's he's a uh, you know culprit as well um, but anyway, that's probably how he sort of lived with himself, I guess, that he thought he didn't directly do the murders, but, you know, that doesn't really mean anything. Sir Harry Oaks would not have been killed if uh, Harold Christie had not let in the people, you know, who, who uh, ended up doing those crimes. So he's definitely a culprit in all of, uh, all of this. And I agree with the other author's findings and and basically what everyone on the island believes, um, you know, that he's the one who should be blamed as well as the person uh, who did it, possibly the skin marshal that um, had been brought in. Anyway, um, the Duke of Windsor is is uh, <laughs> clearly not a good, good guy either, you know, just trying to save his own but in all of this situation, um, you know, just so all of his uh, sordid lifestyle details don't come out, he's willing to put anybody in uh, prison. And, and actually, because they had the death penalty, with the, that guy would have died. And so, and he didn't care because he wouldn't have affected um, his situation. So, you know, he's not a good guy either. Uh, so I don't have that many pictures of these other people. I've just been looking at this um, Duke, of, Duke of Windsor, but, you know, he wasn't a great guy either. So, anyway, this was the uh, kind of sordid tale of Harry Oaks and all of these um, other people, the Duke of Windsor and this so-called friend, Harold Christie, and, and, uh, and, you know, these gangsters. It's just, it's a, it's a very intricate kind of story. And one of the Bahamas most famous cases. Okay, guys, so I hope you have a great night, and I will talk to you again next time. Have a good night.